Hi, my name is Taya. I'm the chair of Young Americans for Freedom. We're a conservative organization on campus. We're nonpartisan. We stand for individual liberty and strong national defense and the free market. And we're very pleased to have Professor Fink joining us today. And just to tell you a little bit about him, Professor Fink is an alumni of UCLA, and he's the most decorated Bruin debater in the school's history with three debate titles. He now practices law and owns a firm, uh, a law firm that focuses on employment and free speech issues. Despite his overwhelming popularity as a professor here at UCLA, he was ousted by the school last spring by boldly explaining to students um, ways in which UCLA tramples on their First Amendment rights. Tonight, he is sharing with you these, these same important lessons that UCLA clearly does not want you to hear. So if you wouldn't mind welcoming with me, Professor Keith Fink. Thank you, Tia, and thank you, uh, Young Americans for Freedom, for, for having me. It's, to me, always an honor to uh, be on this campus. Uh, I'm an alumnus. I love my time at UCLA. I love my students, uh, who I had the honor of teaching for 10 years. And anything I can do, uh, as long as I breathe, to help a UCLA student, uh, I will do. Uh, it's ironic to me that UCLA is holding a Free Speech 101 uh, event this week on the heels of UCLA terminating one of the most popular teachers on campus and the only teacher that teaches students about the importance of free speech. And UCLA no longer is going to have the two free speech classes that it has in its undergraduate curriculum because they fired me. And if you just take a moment uh, after this lecture to look at what Professor Bryan said as to why uh, they had some issues, I guess, with uh, me as a teacher. Professor Bryan said, Fink launched into analysis of a letter by, D by, by Dean Kang. Fink had a provocative tone that was unfavorable towards Dean Kang. Now, why should that be an issue? November 8th, uh, when I'm tired of speaking to the Republicans, I'm going to spend more time about my situation you see my firing, but I just think it's ironic that I'm here uh, uh, on Free Speech Week. I'm sure UCLA is not too excited that I'm here. So how do the administrators, the top administrators here, uh, feel about free speech? I pulled two quotes to tell you what I think uh, is emblematic uh, of the way a UCLA has contempt for free speech in general and students' rights overall. This is from March 14, 2011. Quote, I recoil, recoil, when someone invokes the right of free expression to demean other individuals or groups. I believe that speech that expresses intolerance toward any group of people on the basis of race or gender or sexual, religious, or cultural identity has no place at UCLA. Who said that? Not Chairman Mao. <laughs> Chancellor Block. And in, in about 20 minutes, we'll go over the context of, of, of how we said that. Second quote, April 19, 2016. But those who engage in this tactic, tactic meaning expression by the use of posters to disseminate one's view, will hypocritically hide behind freedom of expression for protection. Who said that? Dean Kang. Dean Kang is the biggest threat on this campus campus to students' liberty and due process. When we go over some examples, you'll see my basis for making that statement. So today's uh, speech, I want to give you time to ask me questions. I've broken it down to uh, uh, three topics I want to, to impart on uh, part of you. One is how the First Amendment applies to UCLA. Second, the exceptions to the First Amendment. And three, we can go over some concrete examples of the interplay between free speech issues at UCLA and the administration's response. And ultimately, you conclude for yourself whether or not uh, UCLA uh, owns up to its claim uh, to uh, protect students' right to free expression. So the first area, many of you don't uh, uh, perhaps understand this. As a student at a public university, <coughs> You have First Amendment protections. That includes your right to free expression, free speech, and free assembly. Because this state, the state of California, believes so strongly in the right to free expression, those who are not as fortunate as you and had to go matriculate in the school, not in Westwood, but in Watts, nine miles away, they have the same rights that you do. Not because it's a public school, 
but because California adopted a law called the Leonard Law some years ago. So students at USC, they have rights coextensive with rights at UCLA, right to free expression. This right to free expression has very few limits. There is no hate speech ex uh, exception. There's no microaggression exception. There's no safe sp space exception to the First Amendment. Schools that enact civility codes, uh, make proclamations uh, that any speech or conduct which is not civil, uncivil, those are illegal. And every time a school has enacted those provisions, they have been struck down. There is a case uh, that I want to mention to you that is probably the seminal case uh, in the area of free speech for college students. And, and I think it uh, underscores uh, the principles that we're going to go over tonight. And the case is called Pappas versus the University of Missouri. In this case, there was a graduate student uh, at the school who was protesting uh, a decision uh, made in a trial where a police officer, police officer was exonerated uh, in a claim of using excessive force. The student distributed a cartoon of a policeman raping the Statue of Liberty and the Goddess of Justice. There was a caption under the cartoon that said, quote, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, and there was an article in the paper, motherfucker acquitted. This type of speech, I guess if you had to label left or right, probably put on the left. This was a student trying to uh, uh, advocate that the decision here made uh, of police abuse was wrong. The Supreme Court said the following, the mere dissemination of ideas, no matter how offensive to good taste, on a state university campus may not be shut off in the name alone of conventions of decency. Now take that quote and compare it to the quote I gave you at the beginning from Chancellor Block, diametrically opposed. And Chancellor Block in his position, even if he's not a lawyer, he should know uh, what the law is in the seminal case uh, on free speech in a public school, that mere conventions of decency are not uh, a reason to fetter students' rights to free speech. In fact, I can tell you, when I was a student here, it was a radically different environment than the environment um, that uh, you are now uh, seeing. And I'll tell you the one instance that still, 40 years later, um, it was a great experience in my life. The speaker was Stokely Carmichael. Stokely Carmichael changed his name to Kwame Touré. He was one of the leaders of the civil rights movement. You, got, you had Malcolm X, um, Stokely Carmichael, and Dr. King. They had different views, different uh, ways that they thought um, the civil rights ball could be moved forward. Stokely Carmichael was a lightning rod. He believed in black power. Stokely Carmichael had views virulent towards uh, anti-Semitism. UCLA hosted a speech, just like tonight's speech, Stokely Carmichael came on campus, largely attended by black students, and in my memory, I think there were three white students, or three white people. I was one, Professor Miller was a second, I don't remember who the third was. It was a tremendous event, even though I disagreed with virtually everything he had to say. He crystallized uh, my own views, my own views were tested, and over and above that, I thought he was a tremendous speaker. And, and I really commend you to go take a uh, look at Stokely Carmichael's speeches. I think you will find him to be an amazing speaker. My point, back then, there was no problem on the UCLA campus of having somebody with views like this, very um, hated views by many, uh, no problem in having a speech. Students acted professionally in letting him speak, and um, I, I probably know him myself, uh, uh, asked him some kind of contentious issue at the end, which you guys are free to ask me contentious issues at the end. That was the UCLA um, when I was a student. Now let me get into the uh, very limited exceptions to free speech. And this is very important for you to have as you cross-check in your four years at UCLA, the king of the cross-check, Chancellor Kang. Because when free speech issues come up, you will see, I believe, Kang or Block or other administrators trying to better students' rights by using the very limited exceptions to free speech on campus. So the first is a true threat. A true threat of illegal conduct 
is prohibited and it's not protected by free expression. For example, you cannot walk up to another student and say, I'm going to kill you. It's illegal. It's a true threat. You cannot say uh, at an airport, I'm going to bomb this place. That's a true threat. That is not hate speech. That is a true threat of illegal conduct. And here are some cases for you uh, to think about in the context of understanding what a true threat is. The first case is called Watts versus the United States. This is a case in 1969. Watts was a young black man during a protest over the Vietnam War. He said the following, they always holler at us to get an education. If they ever make me carry a rifle, the first man I get in my sights is LBJ. Okay, that, that was uh, President Johnson. Is that a true threat? No, it's hyperbole. It's protected speech, okay? And the Supreme Court uh, uh, protected Watts' speech in that case. Even though it said it might be crude or it might be offensive. The second case to think about is called NAACP versus Claiborne. This was uh, Field Secretary of the NAACP, Charles Evers. Uh, there was uh, an attempt uh, to hold him civilly liable. Uh, he had a speech advocating a boycott of certain white-owned businesses. And he said the following, quote, If we catch any of you going in any of them racist stores, we're going to break your goddamn neck. In that case, again, the Supreme Court said that didn't constitute a, 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 constitute a true threat. And the final case that I would commend you to look at is the most recent case, probably, Virginia versus Black. In that case, the Supreme Court Invalidate, invalidated a portion of a law which uh, prescribed any type of cross-burning, even if the cross-burning occurred in an area uh, dominated by African Americans. So the test here, and this is a very limited test, true threats encompass those statements where the speaker means to communicate a serious expression of an intent to commit an act of unlawful violence to a particular individual or group of individuals. We're going to get in about 10 minutes to an instance of students uh, or outside people posting political messages on campus. And you will see how Dean Kang uses this very limited true threat to try to stifle students' uh, free speech. Second exception is obscenity. I don't know if any of you have taken legal classes here. Uh, if you have, I'm sure of your con majors, you've gone over the case of Miller versus California. It's a three-part test. Speech taken as a whole appeals to prurient interest, describes sexual conduct. This is very important to know the limit here, sexual conduct. So if students are making a movie that, uh, maybe you guys like the Saw series, and now you're in an art class and you're making Buzzsaw, uh, and it's talking about chopping people up, uh, that's not sexual. You could say, oh, that's obscene, having a, a, somewhat of a snuff type film. That is not sexual. So this is a very limited, the obscenity. Describes sexual conduct in a patently offensive way, and three, lacks serious literary, artistic, politi political, or scientific value. <coughs> now you will hear administrators quite often, for speech they don't like, say the speech is obscene. It may be obscene in the lay term, but it isn't obscene as it applies to the limited section of obscenity as defined in the law. And the the biggest example where I, uh, I've seen UCLA use, and this is not the current administration, this is about 25 years ago, although I think this came up again, this deals with fraternities having a songbook. And at least 25 years ago, this happened in 1992, there was a songbook, uh, and the song lyrics were uh, pretty graphic. Um, if I was a faculty advisor, I would have been uh, deeply saddened uh, that the students uh, uh, would have this type of gender animus towards women. The, the lyrics were not funny. Uh, but somebody found the lyric book and then it got disseminated. Uh, and again, people glossed over that the students, no matter how offensive the speech is, they have a right um, uh, to articulate their speech. So anyway, that's obscenity. The third is incitement. Incitement intended to and likely to produce Imminent illegal conduct. Again, this is very narrow. This is not hate speech. So, on a university campus at UCLA, you can say all gays should be killed. Now, should you say that? It's not for me to say. But you can say all gays should be killed. That is not incitement. Now, what you can't do is you can't say 
let's go and kill that guy there wearing a shirt that says, I support gay rights. That is incitement. You can say at UCLA, it's time for revolution. What you can't say is, the next hour, let's go to the armory on Wall Street, and then let's have an insurrection at the post office. That's incitement. You can say at UCLA, slavery is good. You can say affirmative action is bad. Again, I'm not telling you that it's wise to say this, but it's right to say this. All I'm telling you is you can say it, and it doesn't constitute incitement. What you can say is, look at the black guy there, let's go and take him by a chain and drag him uh, behind a car. That is incitement. That type of speech is prohibited. Fourth example is fighting words. <clears throat> fighting words generally is a dead letter. The seminal case on this is called Chaplinsky versus New Hampshire. This is about 75 years ago. A Jehovah's Witness was trying to distribute literature in the streets. A cop uh, interacted with him and he said to the cop, you are a goddamn racketeer and damn, a damn fascist. That case has not been overruled. If you look at a case called Gooding versus Wilson after, where a police officer told somebody, uh, a police officer was told by somebody, white son of a bitch, I'll kill you. You son of a bitch, I'll choke you to death. I'll cut you to pieces. In that case, the Supreme Court did not find it to be fighting words. The Supreme Court said speech that is vulgar or offensive is protected. So blue, vulgar type speech does not constitute fighting words. Fighting words really are direct. You directly to somebody say something that will imminently lead to or, or, or necessarily cause that person to strike you. I think it's arguable in, in my mind if the use of the N-word um, would provoke such a response. Perhaps you'd have to look in, uh, at the context. But fighting words is extremely limited. And universities all over the country try to use the fighting word doctrine to, to justify suppression uh, of students' free speech rights. The fifth, UCLA uses this a lot. They like to toss around the term, it's harassing, it's harassing. Harassment in the legal sense, in the context of uh, UCLA, of a university, has been defined in a case called Davis versus Monroe County. When well, I used to teach here, I used to go over this case. It's very important for you to know how limited harassment law is. The conduct must be the following. It must be severe, pervasive, and objectively offensive, and that so undermined and detracts from the victim's educational experience that the victim's students are effectively denied equal access to an institution's resources and opportunities. I mean, the beginning words alone are enough to tell you how watered down harassment law is. It has to be severe, pervasive, and objectively offensive. Words, symbols, and points of view don't constitute harassment as prescribed by the law. I didn't go over a few other exceptions. Um, I don't think they're germane uh, to tonight's talk, but vandalism, extortion, libel, and child porn, uh, those also are not protected by the First Amendment. Disruption also is not protected by the First Amendment, which I find very interesting. Disruption is not protected by the First Amendment, yet when there are Speeches at universities, such as UCLA, and Heather McDonald is the prime example, and students are in the audience interrupting the speaker after the 32-minute mark of this McDonald speech. Students started snapping their fingers, and the eight of them came up strong in front, of the, in front of the speaker and didn't allow her to speak. There was nobody at UCLA, because it was a conservative speaker, to come in. Those students should have been disciplined for violating, uh, for interrupting a lawful assembly. Disruption is not permissible on a university campus. Note, I didn't mention as an exception to the First Amendment hate speech, because there is no hate speech exception to the First Amendment. And shame on those who organized free speech this week by suggesting that we need to have a safe space, we need to have a brave space, and we need to have a space that guarantees no disrespectful conduct, no hateful statements. That is not a university campus. Let me give you some examples. In this country, you have a right to burn a flag. For many Americans, all you did is follow Colin Kaepernick in football. For many Americans, the most hateful thing one can do is burn a flag. But this country has made such a deep commitment to free speech 
that we allow people to burn flags. I don't know if there's anything more solemn than burying a fallen soldier, someone that's gone to war to fight for this country. We have decided as a country in interpreting the First Amendment that there are people, uh, the Westboro Baptist Church in a specific case, they were allowed to come uh, during the funeral of a fallen soldier and hold up signs, God, hate fat, God hates fags. That's because the First Amendment uh, is that important. And you could say that that is hate speech, but not in the constitutional sense. The final example I'll tell you uh, on, on how important free speech is, and that there's no hate speech exception, you probably all know about, uh, this is the music band, The Slants. This came down the last, uh, within the last year. And there was, uh, in that case, the Supreme Court decided that um, you cannot prohibit the slants from getting a trademark in using a name that many people may find offensive or hate and hateful. And here's what the Supreme Court said within the last year. A law found to discriminate based on viewpoint is an egregious form of content discrimination, which is presumptively unconstitutional. A law that can be directed against speech found offensive to some portion of the public can be turned against minority and dissenting views to the detriment of all. The First Amendment does not entrust that power to the government's benevolence. Instead, our reliance must be on substantial safeguards and free and open discussion in a democratic society. This issue of free speech to me, I know the Young Americans for Freedom uh, is hosting this event, this is not a political issue. This is not a left and right issue. I went over some examples of, uh, of you. The first case I told you about Papish, that was a graduate student talking about police misconduct. The case before that was Healy versus James, where there was somebody from the SDS uh, uh, that was having uh, uh, her rights fettered. If you recall, at some point in time in our society, civil rights wasn't something that the majority of Americans wanted. But because we have the right to freedom of expression, those that were advocating for civil rights, no matter that the majority of Americans uh, didn't uh, believe in that, they were allowed to articulate uh, their position. If you remember during the Vietnam War, it wasn't the government's position uh, 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 that those um, who were against the Vietnam War should have a right to speak, but those who were against the Vietnam War because of the First Amendment had a right to speak against the Vietnam War. This is not a left or a right issue. Now let's take these principles General principles of the First Amendment, now you know the exceptions. Now let's see if UCLA actually meets the test. I think they pay lip service at best to the First Amendment, but let's see by looking at examples. Well, the first one I chose, because I know Hobbes and Locke and Rousseau and Kant, uh, although I'm mentioning a lot of dead white guys, right? That's actually probably triggering to uh, many students. Uh, but uh, these were the, uh, some of the seminal thinkers that um, uh, I read when I was a student here and that I would commend you to read. But college is not just about um, reading great minds of the Western world. True? You want to interact with others, other students. Um, and part of college is partying. Okay? Only Scrooge would tell you it's not partying, right? It's having a football team, it's, it's having, it's partying. So this happened two years ago. I know some of you are freshmen and sophomores, maybe you don't know about this. This was the Kanye Western party at UCLA. Uh, this happened with a fraternity and sorority. Students uh, dressed up as Kanye West and Kim Kardashian. They wore baggy pants, dressed as minors, uh, minors in connection with the Gold Digger song. Uh, some students immediately saw these photos. Immediately, this party was racist. These students were dressed in blackface. Now, what is the university's response to this incident? It's an immediate response. Without affording students due process, immediately the response is to suspend the students. Let me read you the quotes from the two henchmen here, which I mentioned at the beginning. First is from Chancellor Block, October 9, 2015. The party, quote, included some people dressing up as exaggerated racial stereotypes. This left many African American students feeling mocked and disrespected. Even if that was not the intent of the party goers, it should not have been hard to foresee that this, was, this would be the reaction. This was poor judgment, and I too was offended. Now let me get this right. The First Amendment means something at UCLA. Freedom of expression means something at UCLA. 
Why isn't there a single mention of the importance of free expression in Chancellor Block's statement? And how does he even know it's exaggerated racial stereotypes? Did he talk to the fraternity and sorority members? Did he dig down to see if it was black soot on their face or actually gold? I don't think he did. Now what about Dean King? What was his comment on this? Quote, what's tiresome is that these incidents follow the same worn script. Some students decide to celebrate using caricatures. Students of color are stunned in protest. Universities respond or don't. The accused deny the accusation or express puzzlement why anyone has taken offense. Next, they show remorse or don't. Pundits push back, complaining about oversensitivity, political correctness gone wild, and the First Amendment. Anonymous hate mail, tweets, comments, and even death threats explode on all sides. Eventually, some resolution, often unsatisfying, is cobbled together. Things recede slowly to normal until the next party season at the next university, rinse and repeat. That's right, rinse and repeat, because you have a right to party. You have a right to have parties that the outside world may deem offensive. And this has been, this has been set forth in the law for years. And the case I would commend you to read is a, a Iota versus George Mason University. And in this case, there was an ugly women contest held at George Mason University. There's, there's, there's a taco uh, fiesta events, uh, hoes and bros. I mean, there's all sorts of these types of sophomoric uh, uh, events uh, at colleges because they're a party. There's some kind of a theme. I don't know, the, 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 Fiji, uh, uh, the Fiji tiki party can offend some people. Uh, so anyway, in this case, um, the court held that the ugly women contest, even though offensive to some, is clearly protected by... Um, the First Amendment. And why is that? That is because costumes convey a message. Costumes are a form of expression. And secondly, the First Amendment protects offensive speech and racist speech. So these statements made by the administrators here were flat wrong. They didn't dig down the facts. The suspension violated the students of due process, and it also violated the students of their First Amendment rights. So that's example number one. The second one, uh, I guess, is most near and dear to my heart, uh, not because I, uh, I don't know this student at all and I, and I don't particularly care for her speech. This is Angela Wallace. I don't think any of you know about her because you were probably in junior high school. But she's going to live in Infinite now. So here's a little 10 seconds of Angela Wallace. Is there manners? Which brings me to my next point. Hi. In America, we do not talk on our cell phones in the library. Where? Every five minutes, I will be, okay, not five minutes, say like 15 minutes. I'll be like deep into my studying, into my political science theories and arguments and all that stuff, getting it all down, like typing away furiously, blah, blah, blah. And then all of a sudden, when I'm about to like reach an epiphany, over here from somewhere, oh! Ching chong ling long ting tong. Oh. Are you freaking kidding me? In the middle of finals week. So being the polite, nice American girl that my mama raised me to be, I kind of just gave him what anybody else would do, that kind of like, you know, it's got its library, like we're trying to study, thanks. And then it's the same thing five minutes later. But it's somebody else, you know. I swear. I mean, I know. Okay, I told Andrew 15 seconds. I mean, I, I don't think she's worth more airtime than that. But uh, okay, this was a less than three-minute rant posted on YouTube. Sadly, she was a poly sci major. I was a poly sci major. I used to, I probably was in the same class when I was a student here. So she did some sort of worse than sophomore. It was foolish, idiotic statements for two and a half minutes. Okay, and then she doubled down on her stupidity, and she posted it on YouTube. Now, I happen to know about this. I'm only one of you, I think, take my but Most of you don't know me. I spend half of my life when I'm not teaching in Asia. I live in China. So, uh, folks that know me, uh, especially uh, my, the Asian, my Asian friends, uh, all I was getting on WeChat, 
can you believe what happened at your school? I mean, my whole identity is tied with UCLA. Uh, and no, I didn't know what was happening. And sadly, uh, nobody contacted me that was my student really to tell me the injustice that was happening to Angela Walls. They say, that's strange, Keith, because you don't really like her speech. Is that right? That's right. I don't really like what she had to say. Uh, again, if she was my student, my child, um, I would be saddened that I didn't uh, inculcate her with a value system or knowledge, uh, uh, you know, uh, that uh, gave her a different view set. In fact, she was so stupid, and she's a poli sci major. Chinese and Japanese are different. Ching Chong Chinaman has nothing to do with the tsunami. I mean, she can't even, I don't know, she can't even get the, she just blended everything together. Uh, so, what happened at UCLA, here we have it again. Uh, the first quote I gave you was the administration's response. I, I, uh, Chancellor Block recoils when someone invokes the right to free expression. Montero from UCLA, UCLA officials are appalled and offended by the, uh, by the sentiments. The students who actually did something wrong and should have been disciplined were those that gave death threats to this student. And that's an upside down one. The administration's response was wrong, student's response was wrong, and the Daily Broom response was wrong. You would think of all the entities that would get it right, it would be the Daily Broom. But the Daily Broom seems to get it wrong quite often when it comes to free speech. So the one voice that stood for Ms. Wallace, can you guess who that was? Me. So you can look back in the Daily Bruin and see a quote from Fink. She did not violate the law. Punishing her would contravene constitutional mandate, uh, mandates. Comments, while foolish, are not a valid claim for peer-on-peer -peer harassment. Remember, I showed you the law on harassment. Did she direct that speech towards anyone? The answer to that is no. <clears throat> is it severe or pervasive conduct? Of course it's not. It's a one-minute, it's a, it's a two-minute rant directed towards nobody. You saw the test. Does it impede the educational opportunities of any students here? No. It doesn't come close to harassment. That was the beginning of the end for me. So remember, I am an alum at this school. I am the most decorated. I spent all my time debate. I won three national collegiate debate champions. My heart and soul I gave to the school. And they hired me back because I was such a good student. And they had no problem with me as a, as a professor until I started to stand up for students' rights. And this was the first instance that I came out of the closet. I came out of the closet that if you're a student and your rights are trampled, even if I don't agree with your speech, I have your back. And now how do I know this? Because I was then asked by a student of mine to give a speech called Know Your Rights. It happened to be raining that day, or the Dodgers, uh, I'm surprised so many people are here because it's been 29 years and uh, the Dodgers may close it out tonight. But not that many people came because it was raining. I asked everybody who was in the audience, look, I talk to myself all the time, what do you go, what do you, uh, why did you come tonight? Two people came from the Dean of Students office. They were spying on me. They were spying on me right on the heels of my comments in defense of Angela Walls. And they had the temerity to leave in the middle of my speech when I didn't change, and probably, I probably ratcheted up uh, my comments, um, my views towards UCLA and free speech rights. So that's the Angela Wall situation. So again, I think uh, UCLA doesn't come close to uh, upholding students' rights in that instance. Okay, the third area, posters. Now I'll first start with these posters um, of MSA and SJP. Again, to me, the issue is irrelevant. It doesn't matter whether I like the message or I don't like the message. <laughs> to me, that's completely irrelevant. This is, a, this is a form of political speech, of political advocacy. So I believe these posters were originally put up by somebody named David Horowitz. Okay, David Horowitz, uh, who is against the BDS type movement. He's extremely pro-Israel. Uh, he's a pretty incendiary speaker. At one time he was a liberal, uh, now he's a conservative. So he first put out uh, these, I guess you could say they're rather tame. I guess they would be, and then there was a cross check by UCLA, and then he kind of doubled down or tripled down on it because he then put up wanted posters. Okay, wanted posters listing names of students that were in MSA and SJP. So what did that then trigger? 
That, that then triggered a second cross-check by Dean Kang. Now, I just stop and say, wait a minute. What's the problem? This is political speech on a university campus. It's the marketplace of ideas. If you don't like this type of speech, the answer is, is to have counter-speech. To me, that's not uh, what the university's response was. So this is a uh, cross-check dialogue over demagoguery. I have it the other way around, demagoguery over dialogue, the way I see it. This is on 4-19-2016. <coughs> At the very end, Dean Kang says the following, uh, in his anger towards these posters. Third, we will deploy all lawful resources to counter any harassment, harassment. How is this poster harassment? I showed you what the law is on harassment. Or intimidation. Wait a minute, he will deploy all lawful resources. Assuming you guys read what's sent out by the chancellor or the dean, if I was you, I would be scared. This type of threat chills free speech on a university campus. I couldn't believe the words that he chose, but he knew exactly the words he was chosen because he was trying to intimidate the students. Then he said, to be clear, these posters violated university policy. Regardless of content, usually as neutral time, place, and manner regulations prohibit unauthorized graffiti and the like. He then goes on to say, in addition, the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals final opinion, the Nuremberg Files website, Planned Parenthood versus American Coalition of Life Activists, makes clear that the closer any postings gets to a true threat, the easier it will be to officially penalize. He then says, I can't help but notice the irony here. The entire point of blacklist is to chill speech, but those who engage in this tactic will hypocritically hide behind freedom of expression for protection. Here he is again, giving lip service to free expression. But what's most troubling to me here is the complete dishonesty of Dean King in conveying to you as students the law. And Dean King is extremely smart. He has two Harvard degrees. He absolutely knows what the law is on true threats. The case that he cites to you has nothing to do with this poster. The case that he cites trying to analogize this to a true threat has to deal with anti-abortions. And there were folks that put up anti-abortion websites. And every time somebody was murdered, they had wanted <coughs> posters, every time somebody was murdered, they were checked off. On the anti-abortion website, they had dead fetuses, they had blood dripping. The facts of that case are not even close to this simple, uh, this simple poster. The poster is no different than a cartoon, a handbill. Typical political advocacy. But I leave it up to you to go look at the case that he cites and look at the posters. Even though you're not lawyers, you determine whether or not you think he's being intellectually honest. Now, none of you know the law. And without you doing that type of check, you would think reading this, it sounds perhaps reasonable. So to me, it's not a true threat. Next example of the posters. This happened, I don't know, within the last year or two. <coughs> These are, I think they're four Republicans. I can't believe we have four Republicans at UCLA, but apparently four Republicans came out of the closet. Okay, and they came out of the closet, I believe, at Santa Barbara. Uh, and you can see here they're uh, demonstrating. I think they're demonstrating. Okay, so it gets, get, out of your, get your agenda out of my restroom. There are only two genders. Transgender, transgenderism is a mental disorder. Again, to me, it's irrelevant whether or not you agree with the message or disagree with the message. The point here is these students have a right to free expression. The first thing that comes to my mind, though, is why would Dean Kang or UCLA weigh in on speech that is not even occurring on campus? This is off-campus speech. What gives them the right to monitor your speech off-campus, number one? Okay, well, of course, this triggered a cross-check. So I suggest that you read his cross-check. Uh, to me, his cross-check is pretty maddening. Uh, there are a number of things that he says. He says, we will, of course, respond to true threats and harassment to the full extent of the law. Here he is again, using his billy club to the full extent of the law. And how is this a true threat? Who, who are these students threatening with the poster? How is this harassment? 
as defined in the law of harassment they gave you from Davis versus Monroe. He then says that the conduct of these students is cruel. Well, how is it cruel? These students have a position, I think, in the context of a political issue as to whether or not North Carolina or other states should enact separate bathrooms uh, or you have unisex bathrooms. And then lastly, in this cross-check, I don't know the fault in logic, those of you who are philosophy majors can tell me, he somehow equates this type of advocacy with the deaths of transgender people. Okay, so here I think uh, UCLA again uh, falls short on, on dealing with the posters. Okay, the last thing uh, uh, I just want to show you, this dude, uh, we have Danny Siegel. You guys know, anyone know Danny Siegel? This is, a, this is what, if you don't speak up, uh, first, they came, first they came for the transgender uh, posters and you said nothing. Okay, you know that, you know, and then they, okay, Danny Siegel. I never met Danny Siegel until I went on Tucker Carlson. Okay, then I went on Tucker Carlson, and oh, so many students wanted to come and sit in my class that weren't even in my class. So Danny Siegel came to my class last year. He sat in my class. Oh, Keith, you're such an exciting teacher, great teacher. Okay, I don't know Danny Siegel. Uh, I want to help you through your situation with UCLA. Okay, Danny, how are you going to do that? Well, I'm the president of the student council. Okay, great. So then I had lunch uh, a few times with Danny. Danny is on the left side of the equation, so... Uh, uh, very smart kid, nice kid, I like them a lot. Last week, I believe, of his presidency, you see this picture came out? I don't know, do you, any of you know about this? Danny Siegel? All right, a photo of Danny Siegel. <coughs> what did Danny Siegel do wrong? It's the same thing all of you guys do. Everybody takes a selfie. All you millennials take selfies all the time. Okay, if you take my class, I, you know, I can go over the social media and the problem with social media. Hey, he took a selfie, all right? I don't think Danny, Danny Siegel seemed to me to be a real sincere kid, good kid, a liberal agenda, wanting to help people. So he took a photo one time, I don't know, he flashed a gang symbol. He was, I think he was just joking. I don't believe he had any malicious intent. Somebody then found Danny's photo and for political capital exploited the photo during the election. My view is the student that I was upset about here was that student who invaded Danny's privacy. Then this came out, nobody supported Danny Siegel. Immediately Danny Siegel gets pummeled by everybody, by the student newspaper, by the students, by the administration. And sadly Danny got bad advice. He didn't speak to me soon enough. He should have never apologized for what he did, but he apologized just like Alexander Wallace was forced to apologize just like the fraternity members were forced to apologize, he then apologized. Which he hurt himself even more than that. Apologize for what? By apologizing seems to suggest that you did something wrong. Well, that's Danny Siegel and his poster. I, I didn't see anybody on the administration. Maybe I like his flashing, I don't like his flashing, but I am consistent. Danny Siegel has a right to express himself, and we should support that. Next area I wanted to go over, um, no more on posters, and we only spent about a minute on this, is on campus speakers. So how does UCLA do on campus speakers? Well, we can just look recently. Milo was supposed to speak here on February 2nd of 2017 and was canceled. Now, why was Milo canceled? I personally don't like Milo Yiannopoulos. Uh, I like having speakers on both sides come to campus, both conservative and liberal, because I believe in intellectual pluralism. I am so lucky, as I say, to have gone and seen Sophie Carmichael when I was a student here. My college debate partner was Gloria Allred's daughter, a very famous lawyer in her own right. She was on the liberal end, I was on the conservative end. Uh, so I believe to have intellectual pluralism. Milo I view as a provocateur, um, and Coulter may be the same. Uh, he's really good for his own brand, but if students want to have him come, he should come. We should, UCLA should provide enough security. On February 2nd, 2017, his event was canceled. Worse, I think, is Heather McDonald. Heather McDonald, I don't have, I don't label her as a provocateur at all. She is an intellectual. Heather McDonald, uh, and funny, Heather McDonald recently criticized as a side note. Uh, this is... Dean King, so do you guys know there was a riot here, uh, the Watts riots 25 years ago? Well, you guys have adopted the words I just used. Oh, you must all be young Americans for freedom. Because according to Dean King, it wasn't a riot. It was a social uprising. 
Okay, so anyway, Heather McDonald has a very good piece um, analyzing um, Dean King's comment on that. But Heather McDonald came to speech. Okay, Heather McDonald is pretty much a supporter uh, that blue lives matter. That blue lives matter, that doesn't mean that black lives don't matter. That doesn't mean that Heather McDonald supports police abuse. Not at all. So anyway, Heather McDonald came to speak, and sure enough, uh, UCLA did not provide Ms. McDonald with sufficient security. You, oh, you have the photo here. So in the middle of her speech, students are snapping their fingers. I don't even get this. Those students who want to have effective advocacy, the hey-ho, Heather McDonald's got to go, uh, uh, snapping your fingers, um, that's not persuasive advocacy if you want to uh, move people uh, against Heather McDonald's position. So this is what is called a heckler's veto. <clears throat> students do not have the right to impede listeners from hearing what Ms. McDonald had to say. So UCLA, to me, completely fell short of that. They should have had uh, security for the event. And these students, they should have been taken up on disciplinary charges. Very last point, because I, uh, back on UCLA, I think that what I have told you has occurred from the top, has trickled down and seeped in to the entire curriculum at UCLA. Now, I don't know how many teachers were like me on my syllabus, I am very clear there's no safe space. Because in the real world, it's, infantil it's infantilizing students to say they have a safe space. And the real world, it ain't safe. In the real world, there are winners and losers. In the real, wor uh, in the real world, you can be fired without any cause. In my classes, there are no trigger warnings. So here's a syllabus. Can you believe this? This is a, this is a UCLA class. Okay, let's, let's go over this slowly, because remember, I only have a public education, so I'm going to slowly. Okay, but since this class is going over sensitive issues, you must bear in mind that, that we will under no, I'm glad the teacher capitalized no, because had the teacher not capitalized no, I perhaps not would have thought it was yes. But under no circumstance tolerate hateful language. I don't know what hateful language is. Is hateful language, is it Adam and Eve, not Adam and Steve? If you wear a shirt like that, is that hateful language? Is having a bake sale saying you, uh, you're against affirmative action, is that hateful language? I don't know. Certain tolerate hateful language, feedback, or behavior initiated in bad faith. Now wait a minute, what does that mean? If you initiate the behavior in good faith, that is hateful, uh, that, is, that will then be tolerated? I don't know, all right. Including acts of racism, I don't know what an act of racism is. Uh, is that supporting President Trump? Is that an act of racism? Homophobia? Well, I guess maybe you could say those in the transgender photo, if they are, uh, that could be homophobia. Sexism, let's see, by saying that um, rape statistics on a campus uh, are inflated, is that sexist? By saying that students should be afforded due process rights in Title IX hearings, is that sexist? I, I don't know. Sexism and class elitism. Well, this is, a, this is typical, I think, um, of what's going on on a university campus. And here, the last one, this came out last year, of course. I mean, it was just so traumatic to be a student at UCLA last year in the event of Donald Trump winning election. I mean, what whoa, whoa was you millennials when you get out of the real world? Um, crying towels, um, needed time off not to take exams. So Dean Gomez, believe this is the same Dean Gomez that decided my fate. This is the same Dean Gomez that determined, with no explanation, that I'm not fit, not qualified, to be a teacher at UCLA. So this same Dean Gomez, who I also listed as biased, but they still allow her to decide on my fate, she was handing out $1,000 candy canes to teachers who put together anti-Trump courses. To me, the best is gender 19, bullied by Trump's tweets. Now, why wasn't anybody offering me $1,000? America is great. Trump is going to make America greater. No one, other than that there's a real progressive <coughs> agenda that UCLA wants to push. So 